Hi, I'm Michelle Segrist, and welcome to the Factory of the Future podcast. This podcast is inspired by my three-volume book series on the evolution of modern manufacturing. Each episode features engaging conversations with game-changing experts discussing the processes and innovations that are changing the landscape of modern manufacturing. Thank you so much for listening. Please do me a favor and leave me a five-star rating on iTunes and take just a couple of seconds to leave a review. And then go ahead and hit that subscribe button right now so you don't miss a single episode. I have a fascinating conversation for you today with a longtime colleague and friend, Carrie Baskins. Carrie is the CEO of Peak Toolworks, and he and I go way back. He was one of the first people I met in the industrial pump industry when I became the editor in chief of the world's largest pump magazine in 2008. Since then, Carrie has developed a specialty for taking struggling companies and transforming them into a profitable and value creating entity. And that is exactly what we are going to talk about today. But first, I want to tell you a little bit about Peak Toolworks. Peak Toolworks is North America's largest manufacturer of engineering, diamond, and carbide cutting tools. And in 2021, Peak will be celebrating their 80th anniversary in business. The company was founded in 1941 by Mr. Arthur Siegel, who learned the art of high-speed machining as a research engineer working on ornaments during World War II. He went on to start North American Products, becoming the first company to manufacture mechanically held solid carbide tips for high-speed machining. Today, Peak is a complete tool solutions provider offering service, new tool, and resale products for the secondary woodworking, composite, and metals industries. Peak maintains a national and direct service footprint of 12 locations across the United States and Canada, allowing Peak to service their customer base directly with 45 service vans picking up and delivering new and sharpened tools every day. Peak offers full life cycle solutions from design to engineering to production of custom tools. Today, Kerry is going to share some of his background with you in just a minute. But first, I want to provide a high-level overview of his career and tell you why he's an expert on this very important topic of transforming struggling companies. First of all, Kerry is a veteran of the United States Air Force. He also holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in Business Administration from Wartburg College, an MBA from Keller Graduate School of Management, and Associates of Applied Science degree in Electronic Systems from the Community College of the Air Force, and a Master's Certificate in Lean Six Sigma from Villanova University. Over the span of his career, Kerry has progressed from entry-level customer service to becoming a very successful and transparent transformational CEO in the private equity space. His career has included work at IDEX Corporation, Grunfoss Pumps, and Accudine Industries, and he has been involved with some of the top names in the private equity world, including Carlisle, BC Partners, Advent International, Audax Group, and Shorehill Capital. Kerry says he's a salesman at heart, but he made the transition from leading commercial teams to leading companies in 2013, when he took over leadership for several mature businesses at Accudine Industries, a joint PE venture between BC Partners and Carlisle Group. It was there that Kerry was first given the opportunity to deploy his transformational toolbox, a compilation of the best business practices he experienced over the course of his career. The resulting improvements in employee engagement, profitability, and operational metrics were not only dramatic, but validated that the approach was spot on for struggling or stagnant industrial businesses. So let's get to it. I'm really excited to welcome Carrie to the podcast. Welcome, Carrie. Hello. How are you? I'm fantastic. Hey, thanks for having me, by the way. And congratulations on your books. I've read them. They're fantastic. And uh, my colleagues are starting to read them out as well. They're very good. Thank you, Carrie. I appreciate that. And thank you for writing the foreword to volume two of my book series on modern manufacturing. It was perfect. And I really appreciate that. Absolutely. 
I'm excited about having a good conversation and I gave a brief introduction to your career, but boy, you have a lot more to tell about how you got to where you are now. So can you give the listeners just a little bit more information about your background and experience? Yeah, for sure. It's interesting. I get asked this quite a bit because as you said, you know, I still call myself a salesman at heart and I really did grow my career and come up through sales. And that goes clear back to when I got out of the military in 1990. My first job was on the inside sales desk at a company called Viking Pump in Cedar Falls, Iowa. I had moved back there and was really getting my civilian career started. And the progression from that role was to a district manager role. The normal progression of the role was to be in that seat for three to five years, learn the business, And eventually, through a training program, you'd have an opportunity to move outside. After about four or five months of being on the inside sales desk, there was an opening in Buffalo, New York. To make a long story short, nobody wanted to move to Buffalo because of the weather. And so I essentially begged the vice president of sales to give me a shot, to send me out, and let me be that district manager. Be careful what you wish for, but (laughs) I, I was a newlywed, and I convinced my wife, Julie, to let us move to uh, Buffalo, New York. And we pulled out and, and went out there. It was interesting because I went past all the sales programs and was essentially sort of set out there to learn the business on my own. And I think that was the roots of how I sort of go about leading businesses today because I took a very pragmatic approach to trying to be successful in this role. And one of the things that I noticed is we oftentimes make things a little harder than they need to be. When I got out to Buffalo, New York, I was working with industrial distributors that were pretty advanced in their knowledge and training on the industry. And I was trying to find ways that I could bring value to them. One of the things that I realized is going and engaging customers is something that can become as complicated as you want it to be or not complicated in the sense that it's asking people for orders and asking them how much they essentially spend on your products. As I got started out there, I really started to make some mistakes because I didn't know how to to really get traction. I'll never forget one of my distributors, Seward Equipment in Rochester, New York. The owner at the time was Jeff Seward, and and he brought me in his office and he sat me down and he said, Carrie, think about it. There's a finite number of customers in every county in upstate New York and Western Pennsylvania. If you get the industrial guides out, you can look and see where every single customer is located and the key contacts of those customers. If you go knock on those doors and find out what they're using for pumps, it really can be as easy as that. That's exactly what I set out to do. And that process that was worked out with Jeff back in literally 1991 is a process that we use today in my businesses within private equity called Grid and Capture, where we literally go out, understand who the customers are, where they're located, what their size of wallet is, and we literally make sure we knock on every door. It's not much more complicated than that. My sales career really went through the next 20 years where I went from being a frontline salesman to product management on up through VP of sales. At one point, as I was sort of accumulating my leadership knowledge and my business knowledge, I started to sort of look toward running a business someday. And for any of us, you get that one big break where somebody gives you an opportunity to do that. That finally came with Accudine Industries when I was recruited to run a group of businesses for my first private equity venture, if you will, Houston, Texas. Sales is one of the hardest jobs there is. You definitely have a passion for sales. And anyone who's been out there, I've been in sales before. It's also one of the most brutally measurable jobs that there is. You eat what you kill. It's difficult. But those of us who have been in sales, we also have a passion for it. And I know that you have a passion. Like you said, you're a salesman at heart. But I've always been curious about just how you made that transition from sales to leading companies. Tell us that story. Well, Michelle, it's interesting when you talk about the sales piece. My passion for sales really started back in around fifth or sixth grade. And I've told some people this story 
Me and some of the, the buddies in my neighborhood, we used to go up to the high school to play football. We had Christmas break or something. And we were walking back through town one day. And this is the town of Columbus Junction, Iowa. You know, I think the population was like 1800. And we're walking down through town and here come a light blue, brand new Cadillac comes up through town, which if somebody has a Cadillac in that town, everybody notices it. And I remember we stopped on the sidewalk and watched it go by. And I can't remember what this person's name was, but I remember somebody said, hey, who's that? And they said, oh, that's so-and-so. And they go, what's he do for a living? And one of my buddies says, um, he sells big stuff. And I remember walking home, thinking about that guy, and thinking about that job, and I thought to myself, I'm going to sell big stuff someday. And quite literally, from that point, even through college, I always thought about how cool it would be to be in control of sort of your own financial destiny through sales. To this day, I still get excited about engaging customers and getting the order. And so the, I, I had to tell that story. Uh, yeah, because, it's a great uh, story. Yes, yeah, a fantastic yeah, story. Love to look back on that. So look, from a transition standpoint, I always sort of look back and realize that I've been a student of leadership all the way back, probably even to high school. I had great coaches. I had fantastic teachers. But I always sort of studied the way that leadership engaged people. One of the things I noticed early on is that leadership sets culture. The more a leader is able to draw the best out of the people around them. We call it, to this day, we call it creating a safe environment. Creating that environment where people can come to work and be at their best, and they feel like it's safe to both try things and make mistakes. When you get that dynamic created, great things can happen in, in any organization, whether it's a football team or a business or a classroom. It's really about bringing out the best in people. Throughout my career, I always had a tendency to watch leadership around me and notice what worked and didn't work. I didn't realize it until I got a good 15 to 20 years into my career that I realized I was starting to really track the best business practices. I've had some fantastic mentors in my career. And I've had examples of people who really struggled from a leadership standpoint. But I always noted that. And I was always sort of putting together my toolbox so that if the day came and I, I was honored enough to be able to run a business, I would be able to really kind of apply these learnings to the practice of leadership. As I had said earlier, you get that one big break that really came back in about 2013 when I was given the opportunity to be a general manager of about a $240 million business. I had a good mentor in a gentleman by the name of Chris Kreps, who is a executive vice president today with Roper Industries. He was a fantastic mentor for me uh, in making that transition from commercial to running a business. But what was really kind of helpful too is when I went into this, Chris and I sat down and Chris said, look, you've got an approach that's really interesting in going about leading these businesses. I really want to give you the leeway to do that. And he did. He was very supportive of me of rolling out this pragmatic approach to how we select leadership, how we reduce complexity, how we start with the end in mind and work backwards. That's a big part of what is needed from a private equity success standpoint. One of the big differences in private equity over just a normal company or like a, a public company or a family owned business, if you will, is private equity ventures have a shelf life. Private equity buys a business. A lot of private equity firms will say that they are a buy and build type of an enterprise. So they want to get a business that has a good foundation of products in good markets with good opportunity for organic growth as well as acquisition growth. And then they want to, you know, obviously buy it at a good value, build it out over three to five years, and then sell it for a higher value, which brings return to their investors. You'll typically look at about a five-year horizon. And what you know is certain things have to be true at the end of those five years. That becomes kind of an interesting endeavor for most business leaders because you have to work very fast. You know, if you don't get the results, when you get to that day where you're standing in front of buyers and you're selling the business, you've got a lot of investors behind you that are expecting big returns. You don't really get to, to sit in that room uh, with those uh, investors, with those uh, potential buyers 
unless all these things come true over that five-year period. I think I read that the washout rate of private equity executives is something like 65 to 70%. Tough position, if you will. Yeah, for sure. It's interesting because you said that when you get the opportunity to lead a company, if that's what you want to do, and you get that opportunity, that's one thing you take it. But it's what you do with it once you have it that matters. Through the course of your career, and that was just one company that you led. I mean, you've led more companies since then. Through that process, as I said in the opening, you developed this transformation toolbox, which is a collection of your best practices from this experience. Can you explain to the listeners and to me where this transformation toolbox came from? And I think we'll get into the nitty gritty of it a little bit, but I just want to know what inspired it and why did you think it would work? The toolbox was a compilation of really best business practices over the course of my career. One of the things that we notice in business is that the fundamentals always work. If you study some of the greatest football coaches of all time, one of the things that I have always found fascinating is that they bring these tremendous athletes into that first day of practice when the new season starts. And I remember reading about Vince Lombardi and he would bring his team in. And one of the first things they would do on day one is spread out on the field, get in their football stance, and the coaches would go around and make sure their stances were absolutely perfect. When the quarterback threw the football, he threw it exactly the way he was supposed to, and the receivers had their hands the way they were supposed to. But the fundamentals are what really won the games. One of the things that uh, we notice in business is that there's no real replacement for the good fundamentals. One of the catchphrases I often use is that we earn the right to grow. When you start a private equity venture, many times these companies can be very distressed. And you look across the business and you might say, profitability is really poor in this company. How we do accounts receivable makes no sense. And we have very poor cash flow. People are getting hurt in the factory. We have too much inventory and our productivity is extremely low. And as you look across that, it makes very little sense to go out and try to introduce lots of new customers to that business and do acquisitions when the house isn't even in order. And so the catchphrase that we often use is, we earn the right to grow. When we get this, you know, kind of kick one of these off, the first thing we do is sit down and look at the fundamentals of the business and understand, are we aligned with this business executing exceptionally well on just the very basic things, if you will? The toolbox looks across that entire business and addresses those fundamentals in a very structured way. What's very important as well, as I had said earlier, is starting with the end in mind. I remember in both Amaral Belt Tech, which was a private equity role that I had prior to Peak Toolworks, that was a business that was very distressed, but had a fantastic product. And one of the very first things we did was we sat down and we set what we call True North. And we said... Three years from now, we're going to stand in front of buyers. Let's just lay out exactly what has to be true that day. What are the headlines, the exit headlines that we want to be able to talk about to those buyers? And we said in human resources, in finance, in operations, in sales, in IT, all these things have to be true. And then we wrote down what the actual current state was. And once we actually had the gaps of the things that were wrong, we knew on day one what the priorities were to be fixed. That's what becomes a very, very pragmatic approach because you're not trying to get exceptionally fancy. You're trying to align the whole organization on what is vitally important and then distilling that down into a very understandable plan. So let's just, if we talk about the toolbox, let's start about, let's just get grounded in the fact that we're always going to start with the end in mind. Does that make sense so far? That makes perfect sense. And just to back it up just a little bit, because Carrie, I have zero experience in the private equity world, and maybe some of the listeners are like me. So can you help me and the listeners understand the difference between a private equity turnaround and a privately owned or public company? Well, yes, it's very much about the shelf life. Okay. So when I say shelf life, a private equity venture is going to sort of end in anywhere from three to maybe eight years, depending on how long a private equity company holds a business. 
So what private equity does is they pull together money from investors, they build funds, and they go out and they seek what they often call platforms. So they'll seek out a business that they can say, you got a business that's $70 million that has a lot of other companies around the world that are prime for acquisition. And that $70 million business from an organic standpoint has plenty of runway to be a hundred, hundred twenty-five million dollar business through organic growth. But fundamentally, the business might be a bit distressed. It could be an older industrial that's been around 40, 50 years, you know, really had a, a lot of um, kind of attention to the fundamentals. They will look at that and say, these are very viable products. We can build a platform off of this. So they'll buy that business for, let's just say, a a five times profitability multiplier. They'll bring in a a leadership team or build out the current leadership team, and they'll set a plan over the next five years to start accelerating the growth, taking cost out of the business that has kind of hung around for a lot of years, and making acquisitions to then build that $70 million business to, let's just say, $140, $150 million or, or larger. And then now that you've got a business that is fundamentally strong, has a great acquisition record, and then has additional growth beyond the sale date, private equity will either sell it to a strategic, which would be another company that is in that space, or they'll sell it to another private equity firm who might want to take that $150 million business and build it, say, to to $300 or $350 And then when it sells... The investors in the business really get paid off of that profitability from when they bought it to to when they sold it. Did that okay. help? Yes, it does a lot. It helps tremendously. And I'm sure that there are different definitions of what a struggling company is. I mean, sure, I'm sure that definition changes depending on what type of company and what type of industry. But when the struggling company approaches you about a transformation, how can you be so sure that you can fix it and turn things around for them? And that's a great question. So that's really how it works. You know, you'll get that call from a recruiter or from one of your contacts in the industry, and they'll send you a deck of slides or a deck of information about that particular business. And what I have usually done is taken a look at the business from just a product market standpoint, because I mean, clearly, if if somebody called you and said, I have a struggling typewriter company that makes ribbon typewriters, and they just don't seem to be able to compete against computers, that's (laughs) the biggest no-brainer. It's like, hey, gang, I can't fix this, right? Right. Um, And so the businesses, oftentimes, you know, I'll get a deck and I'll look at it. And what we do is we start to pick it apart from a fundamental standpoint. And you can learn a lot about a business by studying its profit loss statement, its balance sheet, and just looking at the fundamental financials of the companies. I look at the product. Is it still in a viable market? Is there still good runway to the product? What's the position in the market? And why or why can't this business actually win in going after organic growth? What are the fundamental problems of the business and those are typically, if it, if it has a good product, typically the fundamentals are something that can absolutely be fixed. Are there outstanding lawsuits in the business that are going to really create headwinds? You know, are you going to have to overcome two or three major lawsuits before you can really deploy fundamental things that have to fix the business? And then does the private equity partner have a realistic view on what that business can be? What's their expectations on exit day? Once we're clear on that, and we'll talk about this shortly, Michelle, 80-20 is a process that is a very big part of this toolbox. Mm -hmm. And what 80-20 does is helps you understand the core of a business. Where is money really made, but also where is it lost? It's based on the Pareto principle that 80% of your revenue comes from 20% of your customers and 80% of your revenue comes from 20% of your your best-selling products. So part of this diligence is to apply the 80-20 principle and understand the real core of the company. And what what we know about 80-20 is is say somebody comes to us with a $100 million company that is making, say, 10% profitability at the bottom line, 
when we apply 80-20, what we start to realize is the real core of this business is maybe 65% or six, you know, uh, 65 million. And what they're handing us isn't necessarily a hundred million dollar business, hundred billion dollar business making 10%. It could very well be a 65 to 70 million dollar business that should be making 22%. Yeah. Through a pretty pragmatic math problem, we can actually get to that pretty quickly to understand that this is really a jewel that we're going to be working with here. Right. So uh, identifying the company and making sure that it's a viable project is part of the first steps, it sounds like. And then making sure they decide they want to do it. And then they bring it to you and you have to decide that you want to do it. And you kind of answered this question. I was wondering, what, where do you start after that? Like, what are the next steps once all that is decided? And some, sometimes the hardest part of anything is making the decision. And then it's just the details. Yeah, well, you know, that's a great question. Let me describe what my first day looks like when okay. I start one of these. Okay, that's a perfect um, way to answer it. Yes. Yeah, so this occurred both in the company that I led in Chicago, which was in the conveyor belt business, and, and also with Pete Toolworks. Quite literally, I walked in the, the door the first day and had asked all employees to be assembled for an all-employee meeting so I could introduce myself. There's some certain basic things that when I start, I want to make sure everybody understands is extremely important to me and what is going to be true. I think most of the employees are relatively shocked by my opening statement, but I look everybody in the eye and I tell them with all sincerity that one of the most important things that a CEO can do is to manage Sunday night for their employees. And when I talk about Sunday night, if you hate your job and you hate coming to work, you're going to hate it the most on Sunday night because that's the start of waking up in the morning and having to go there for five miserable days. That's so true. And if, if it's miserable coming to work, we can't fundamentally fix this business until we start to address that. And so I make it very, very clear from the start that what we're going to create is a safe environment, an environment to speak up, an environment to be at your best, and that one of the things we're going to measure with boring consistency is that at least 80% of our entire employee ranks believe that coming to work in this company is not only a great thing, but they would recommend it to others. That's what we start laying out on day one in the first hour as what we call True North. And I tell them, if you want to be able to tell your family what we do here and what we're going to do here every year that you're here, here's the four things that will never change. We're always going to grow sales. Typically, it's in an industrial business, it's at least 4 to 7% net of inflation. We're going to study what good profitability looks like in our niche. And we're going to look at the public companies and the private companies that we have access to. And we're going to meet or exceed the profitability expectations for our industry. We're going to measure the customer experience, which typically is or often is done through net promoter score. And we're going to look, make sure that at least 80% of our customers would recommend us to others. And then lastly, we're going to do an annual employee survey. And we're going to make sure that 80% of our employees say that this is not only the best place to work, but we would recommend this place to others. And we're going to have cross-functional teams that work on that sort of incessantly to make sure that, that that's true. And I make sure everybody understands that that's the four pillars of strength in our business that, are, that we're going to make sure are true. Now, here's what's interesting as the toolbox starts coming together, Michelle. If you start to analyze the problems that business leaders and leadership teams tackle, nearly every problem you tackle impacts those four things in some way. And so the toolbox really unfolds a very pragmatic approach to ensure that those four things are true. Anybody listening to this that, uh, that runs a business or has run a business they're probably jumping up and down right now and saying, you forgot cash, you forgot cash. Um, <laughs> yes, sure. you know, we, we could add a fifth pillar if you want, and we could say, you got to be profitable, you got to make money. Yes, you have to generate cash and you have to generate healthy cash, but that's really part of the fundamentals of the business. And it seems when we've got good sales, we've got great EBITDA, employees love being there and customers are saying great things about us. Our cash is usually exceptional. That will be the result of all those things is the cash. 
That's correct. So I want to just lay that out and, and let you know that day one is extremely important. And it's very important that we live up to that. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Yep. Yeah. The, let's just get to the yeah. nitty gritty. I want to hear a little bit more. I want to get down and dirty here to the details because as you know, the devil is in the details. And I will just say up front that you are writing a book about this philosophy and about the transformation toolbox. And we'll shamelessly plug that at the end, of course. But that <laughs> right. book, you are in the middle of writing this book. So I know that you don't want to reveal everything, but can you at a very top level briefly explain the elements of this approach that you call the transformation toolbox? I will. Absolutely. I want to kind of start on this from the people side, because quite literally, the most important part of a successful business are the people. I want to go back for just a second to the year 2000. I was working for one of the largest pump distributors in the Midwest called JCI Industries. Interestingly enough, this was one of the first roles where I was in a position to have a sizable team around me where I was really leading people at kind of a, a larger level, if you will. One of our senior management meetings, uh, the owner of the business brought in a consultant by the name of Julie Shell. Julie came in. She, at the time, was working for General Motors, and she was a uh, organizational development leader working literally with the CEO and the senior managers on a project called Go Fast, which is how they were rethinking their big truck business at General Motors. But what she was and is exceptionally gifted in teaching is how to build high performing teams, how to pick high performance leaders. And she too has a very pragmatic approach to helping to align the organization you know, to the goals of the business. Yes, and, Julie, I just want to jump in. Julie is yeah, actually going to be a guest on this podcast next week. And you're going to be back. We've already talked about this. You're going to be back. And Julie's going to talk a little bit more about the people side of all this. So I'm glad that you mentioned her so we can go ahead and say that we'll dive deeper into the people side of all this next week when she's here. Yeah, people don't want to miss this one because Julie's fantastic. And she is a ton of fun as well. She's the best. She is a hoot. Absolutely. When I met Julie, I was absolutely blown away by what she was teaching us. She has a really interesting way to uh, to get teams to a, a point of vulnerability to really break down what is working and not working and holding teams back from being high performance. But what she really taught me is that leaders are individuals. She has a statement that I have used incessantly over the years. She always says, you can't put into people what God left out. And it's a very nice way of saying that some people end up in leadership roles and it's not a good fit for them. Or the needs of the organization don't necessarily fit the skill set of that leader. I bring this to attention because after I walk out of that room with all the employees, what is the most important piece for me to focus on at this point is the executive leadership team. Because from the CEO through that team, that sets really the culture of the business. And what I want to understand is what kind of leadership team are we starting with? But most importantly, how do the people that report to that leader feel about the leadership? What's working and not working? And I do a lot of skip level meetings where I sit with employees and I ask them to just shoot straight with me. Tell me how things are working here. What's working, not working? What do you think would change? should change, what stay the same. And I get a good 360 view of the strength of leadership, the value that's being brought and where we need to focus. Sometimes leaders are doing a fantastic job. They just need more support in certain areas and we're in a great position to continue on. And sometimes we have to make wholesale changes to kind of change the personality and the culture of the organization. So step one is we have to build a high performing leadership team. We focus that and simultaneously, we are starting to put together what the end needs to look like. We want the fundamental like, sort of headlines of, of what needs to be true at the end. Let's just assume that over the course of the, of the next three to six months, we get a good assessment of leaders. We get the right leaders in the right seats on the bus. And we've set our true north now, and we understand what has to be true on exit day. We will roll out the 80-20 process almost immediately when we feel like the leadership team is stable. And let me just sort of talk briefly about what 
80-20 is all about. 80-20 comes from Illinois Tool Works is probably the company that took this 80-20 concept of 80% of your revenue coming from 20% of your customers and turning it into a very structured business process. I learned it when I was at IDEX Corporation. We had a guest speaker that came in from a company called Stratagex who came in and did full day seminars on how you can reduce complexity in a business using this very specific approach and this mathematical approach to analyzing your company. And what it does is breaks this business down to its core components. If you really can visualize a square that has four boxes where the upper left-hand corner is your best customers buying your best products, okay? Okay. Statistically, if you run the math across any business, it almost always comes out to somewhere between 63 to 67% are your top customers buying your best-selling products. If you look towards the right in the upper right-hand corner, that's your best customers buying non-standard products, and that's typically somewhere around 16%. Down in the lower left-hand corner is your small customers buying your best-selling products. That's around 16%. And in the lower right-hand corner are your smallest customers buying non-standard products. Then that's 4% of your business. The thing that we forget in business or we don't realize is your costs are often spread evenly across all four boxes. So if you looked at those as many profit and loss statements, you would literally say, wow, 44% of my revenue is coming in through small customers buying non-standards, but it takes 25% of my cost to get that business. And you start to realize, I make all my money on my core. I give all my money away trying to do things that aren't part of my core. So 80-20 is a process that in a very structured manner helps us to understand our core and understand how our costs in the business are aligned to either support and grow our core or to try to be something that we're not. That's a very high level flyover of 8020. I hope that makes sense. It makes perfect sense. And actually, Carrie, years ago, before I had my first baby, and she's 25 now, I was in sales. When I got pregnant, I told my boss that I wanted to just work part-time. And I think he was applying this. And you tell me if he did. I had maybe 100 customers at the time that I worked with. And he said, fire 90 of your customers and only keep the 10 that you make the most money with and spend the least amount of time with if you want to go part-time and still make money. And this is exactly what I thought. Fire 90 of my, I mean, I didn't fire them. I gave them to other salespeople. But, you know, get rid of 90 customers and only keep 10? How am I going to survive? How will I pay the mortgage? How will I buy diapers for this baby? But it worked. I did what he said. I trusted him. I spent less time pounding the pavement with the customers that never came through and the most time with the customers that I earned the most money with. So is that kind of the same principle? It really is. I'll give you a really interesting example of this. One of the tenets of the 80-20 process is what we call target selling. And what we do is We take that 64% in the upper left-hand corner, which we call quad one, okay? Mm -hmm. And let's just say that's 60% or 65% of your revenue. That's a small percentage of your customers, but it's where most of your revenue is coming. We got our sales force together and we said, here's a simple exercise we want you to do. We want you to take, you know, 150 customers, if you will, and we want you to go out and just ask the question, how much do you spend every year on the kind of products that we sell? Okay. And we just want you to just get that number. And these are our best customers. So we at least have the intimacy with those customers to ask that question. And we give them a month or two even to go out and find this out. And here's what we found. This is a a $70 million business. The sales force had never asked that question. And they came back and we put a spreadsheet together and said, here's how much we currently do, here's how much they do with our competitors in the very products that we sell. And remember, this is our best customers and this is the difference. And Michelle, when we added it up, we were leaving $29 million of revenue on the table with the smallest grouping of our best customers. And the number one reason that we weren't getting that business, we weren't asking for it. Wow, as simple as that, right? As simple as that. So if you look at the math on this, we could go to every small customer in the business, which is the vast majority. We could have said, 
we no longer are going to sell to, to you and we're going to take the cost out that's associated with you and we're going to focus on this $29 million, and the business would start to grow in double digits at a much less cost basis and we would be a much stronger company. Now, we don't do that. We don't just go fire all of our small customers. It's not about that. 80-20 is about treating them differently. If you fly on United Airlines 150,000 miles a year, you're going to be treated differently than your mother-in-law who might fly twice a year. It's just right. the way it works. So the transformation toolbox, you start with the end in mind and you work backward. You set your true north. You create a safe environment. You recruit competent leaders. You earn the right to grow. And then you focus on this 80-20 complexity reduction. Are there other elements to the toolbox? that we Of have course. Covered? Now, Another big piece of this, and since I focus very predominantly on industrial businesses, lean methodology is something that's been around for quite some time. And it can be anything from very complex, if you start to study uh, Lean Six Sigma and the, the nitty gritty of what takes place, obviously, on, on the floor of a manufacturing plant. And, and Michelle, more than anyone, you've been around this a ton yes. you know, through the, the books that, that you've written, et cetera. But there's one fundamental piece of lean methodology that works every time. And what we deploy is what we call lean daily management, okay? So the five pieces of manufacturing that are exceptionally important are safety, quality, delivery, inventory, and productivity, SQDIP. SQDIP, okay? right. Now, as you look at that, the other piece of that that we really communicate in our uh, facilities is we earn the right to progress towards the right. So let's look at it this way. you got to be safe in the plant. And if you can't come to work, if we can't provide an environment where employees can be safe, we haven't earned the right to even worry about quality, right? So once we know we can do a quality product and hold consistency and quality, we've earned the right to deliver it. And if we can have a safe plant, with a quality product and deliver product on time, we've earned the right to inventory our core and the right products that support the delivery of our core products. And once we are safe, we have great quality delivery and inventory, then we can help our employees become more productive. And so what Lean Daily Management does is in all of our facilities, we have a SQDIP board that is up. And we stand in front of that board every single morning with leadership and key people in, in the facility. And what we do is we talk about what, what happened yesterday and we talk about what we're going to do today. And we make sure that on a daily basis, we're hitting those metrics. And when we miss a metric, we record that in what we call a second level Pareto and we start to set trends. Let's say that from a safety standpoint, people are cutting their fingers because they're not wearing their gloves. Just for example, we get an unfortunate two or three of those that happen over the course of, of three months. We're going to incessantly go to root cause on why we're cutting our fingers. And we're going to fix that based on what we're seeing is, is happening from a trend standpoint. Clearly, if somebody cuts their finger, we're on it within an hour and we have an immediate walk through and understanding of what's going on, but we're going to attack the problem at its source. The same goes with quality. As we get returns back, if it happens, we're going to go uh, right, up, right to point of impact and understand why is this happening? How do we make this go away? And we're looking at it on a daily basis. From day one, with our operations leaders, we get lean daily management set up and we make it a cadence that takes place. I learned this from my CEO, uh, a prior uh, private equity venture. He had a saying, he said, we're going to execute on this every day with boring consistency. Boring consistency. Um, I hear you and, use that phrase a lot. Yep. It makes sense. Yes. And what's good though is, again, this gets back to one more thing on Sunday night when people come to work. They know this is the way that, that we do things. There's no surprises and we stay very consistent with these fundamentals. It becomes very popular with people because they know what to work on from a day-to-day -day basis. I wouldn't call it a next step, Michelle, as much as it's a key fundamental that has to take place as we get started and start getting our factories to a consistent level of excellence. That makes sense. Tell me about the one-page business plan. That's a part oh, of this yeah. toolbox. If anybody that, that is listening is familiar with Danaher Corporation and their policy deployment process, 
This is essentially a derivative of policy deployment in a little bit more understandable methodology that can be deployed on a annual basis, tracked on a, on a monthly basis. We set, obviously, that true north of what we have to be at the end of this private equity venture, if you will. Then we work backwards from there, and we literally set the annual headlines that have to be true from a year-over-year basis, the things that we want from a milestone standpoint to be true. And then we distill that down to what, the, what we have to get done in a given year. We sit down as a leadership team. We ask the leader of sales and marketing, IT, finance, operations, human resources to put together the three to five goals that they have for the business with the stipulation that your key performance indicators or KPIs have to be very, very measurable. In other words, you could say in your KPI, let's say that you say, I want this to be a much better place to work. And the KPI is our employees tell us it's a better place to work. That's not going to be acceptable. What is acceptable is on our measured employee motivation survey, 80% 80% or let's just say we're, we're going for 70% because we're in the process of fixing it. 70% of our employees will state in the employee motivation survey, we're a best place to work. It's got to have a measurable metric. Okay, so then another great example of, of how this would work is let's say operations. If you're just getting started, let's say your on-time delivery is 70%. So in the SQDIP process, the D or delivery, you're putting this on your one-page business plan, and you know that I, you have to get to 95% to satisfy the customer. Clearly, your KPI is going to be 95% on-time delivery, right? Right. As we progress over the years, we could get to a point where... Like in my case at Peak Toolworks, we've got 12 facilities and we may be running very close to a 95% on-time delivery, but we have one facility holding us back. The 2021 strategic plan may actually say this year, only this facility has got to come up to 95% because we know the other ones are holding it perfectly. We're going to focus pinpoint on the impact place where we're going to make the biggest impact on the business and we'll drill it down to that least common denominator. So what the one page business plan does is it aligns the organization very specifically on the three to five things that are most important. Those functional one pagers link up to a one overall page that drives the focus and true north for those 12 months of the business. And the KPIs are then loaded into what we call a bowler chart. We call it a bowler because it looks a lot like a, you know, a scorecard for, uh, for bowling. But what it really does is says, this is my goal. This is monthly what I'm trying to do. And we color this red or green, whether or not you hit it. And we talk about it every single month. And if you're red two months in a row, meaning you missed your target two months in a row, you owe us a root cause countermeasure and a very specific understanding of when you'll get back to green. And it helps the organization align specifically on what are we doing How are we measuring success? And what also makes it very powerful is it becomes a fantastic communication piece for the board of directors. Because anybody who's run a business knows that if you don't have alignment with your board leadership, they can put you in the ditch very quickly because you'll spend all your time explaining. And another one of my great mentors from the past used to say to us, if you're explaining, you're losing. So making sure that we're very, very clear What we're doing, that the board is aligned, and how we're going to measure it is important. I guess that also keeps the leaders, it keeps them accountable to those goals. It does. That's a very good point. It keeps them accountable. But Michelle, the other thing it does for you, one of our key fundamentals in the toolbox is organizational alignment. Now that we have a one pager and we know exactly what we're going to do and how we measure it, every single performance package for every employee is specifically aligned to the KPIs in the business. And because there's only three to five, it's not complex. It's not one of those things where somebody might say, well, I'm not really clear on that. Everybody's very, very clear on how our success is measured and what your specific contribution expectation is. And we take performance management alignment very, very uh, seriously. 
Well, this is all so fascinating. I know we have a lot more to talk about, but there is going to be a part two to this conversation. As we mentioned before, Kerry is coming back and he's bringing with him his longtime partner and colleague, Julie Shell. And Julie is an expert in change management. She is going to dive into the people part of all this equation, and you will not want to miss this. In the meantime, Carrie, I just want to thank you for being here with us and sharing your knowledge and expertise. But can you just give us a little taste of what we're going to learn next week in part two when Julie joins us? Yeah, absolutely. Julie has a toolbox, if you will. And she has really kind of honed her craft over all these years working with companies like General Motors, Ford Motor Company, Blue Cross Blue Shield. She's worked with every leadership team at every company I've been involved with since the year 2000. So she's got quite a resume of success. And what's interesting is her toolbox always works. And so she's going to talk about what works and doesn't work with leadership teams, how teams go from forming up to being high performance. I think people will find very fascinating, Michelle, is she talks about focusing on the individual because all of us have a specific makeup, whether we're introverted or extroverted, how we process information, how we then take that and interact with others. And she's got some pretty fascinating ways of breaking down the individual and getting to understand what makes a person tick and how that then translates to success in in leadership. Plus, on top of that, she's got a personality that is really a hoot to be around. She's really fun. And she actually sent me a visual of what she's going to talk about. And it's all different pictures. And I, I can't wait to see the translation of what these images mean. So I'm really looking forward to that. But in the meantime, just for now, to wrap things up, I want to give you the last word. Is there anything else that you can tell us about how you help these struggling companies make a transformation like this? If I left people with anything, I would essentially say it's not as hard as many leaders try to make it. Yes, there are complex business problems that have to be sorted out, but it starts with a real clear direction of what we're trying to accomplish. It starts with having the right people on the bus and supporting them incessantly, making sure people like to come to work and it's a great environment for them to grow. You start to put the very basics together and it's very uh, interesting how things just start to fall into place and the fundamentals start to really work for the business. I think that's what I would emphasize. And as I'm putting the book together and putting these best business practices together, I really am emphasizing how the fundamentals come together bringing your core business together and the people to drive success and growth and make for a really great company. Well, I'm really looking forward to talking more about this next week, Carrie. And thank you so much for being here. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. You're one of my favorite people out there in industry, always teaching me something new. Appreciate you being here. I really look forward to next week. And I just want to give our listeners a really exciting first look into Carrie's new book, which I'm so excited about. He's writing it at the recommendation of quite a few peers in the industry, and it's underway. It has a target release time of sometime toward the end of the third quarter of 2021. So we're going to hold you to that, Carrie. It includes the process for turning around a struggling business, which is surprisingly pragmatic. Just like coaching a winning sports team, it starts with the execution of very basic yet essential fundamentals with my favorite phrase, boring consistency. Once that is mastered and you earn the right to grow, there are very specific value creation levers that can be pulled to unlock value relatively quickly. In private equity, we're working against the clock and shareholders get paid seven times to 10 times for every dollar of value created. This book will help you cut through the complexity and get right to where the value is hidden quickly. That is the key to winning in the PE world. So we are really looking forward to that book and I'll give you more details as it gets closer. This brings us to the end of the show. Thank you so much for listening. Please do me a favor and subscribe, rate, and review the podcast on iTunes. If you have interesting information to share and want to contact me about being a guest on a future episode of this podcast, 
please send me an email at michelle at navigatecontent.com. You can also send me questions that I will have my expert guests answer for you on a future episode. And in the meantime, please check out my book series on modern manufacturing to read more than 30 real world case studies about how global companies are using smart technology and innovation to build the factory of the future. All the links to the books and articles mentioned in this podcast are in the show notes. Have a great week and please join me for the next episode of Factory of the Future.